Here we have a section of moose hide that came off a recently deceased moose, and it's a really good example for us to talk about winter ticks, what they are, how they affect moose, and what the implications are on the moose population. So this right here is an adult female winter tick. It looks a lot like any old dog tick that you would find on you from your yard based on the fact that it's on a moose in the middle of the winter in this life stage. We know that it's a winter tick. So if you come and zoom in here, you can see, and this is a section of the spine, just how many ticks are on this animal. Just about any cross section of fur that I go through, you're going to find these ticks. This small section of fur right here obviously has quite a few ticks that I've shown you. Now imagine what that looks like over the entirety of a moose. During my master's degree, we actually counted moose hides of a calf moose. So when we had a deceased collared individual, we'd remove the hide in the field and actually count every single tick. We had one tick count that had 90,000 winter ticks on it. Tick counts averaged 40 to 60,000 per animal, but these are on calf moose. So that's a seven to eight month old moose. That's a 350, 400 pound animal. So you can imagine that when an animal has that many ticks on it, that many parasites that are removing a blood meal at one specific point in time, it can have negative implications. So I'm going to show you a few different life stages of this tick. This right here is a nymph. So this is a tick that is about to morph into its adult form. So it's already taken one blood meal. We'll find some adults in here. Oh, this is actually a really good example. We have an adult female next to an adult male. So that right there is an adult male with the striations. And this is an adult female, the one that resembles your everyday dog tick. This adult male is going to take one more blood meal here in the next few months. That's late March, early April. He won't get too much larger, but this female is going to take her last feeding in the last few weeks of March, and she's going to engorge to the size of a grape. So she can actually take one to two milliliters of blood per tick. And these, that blood meal, that feeding is the one that actually kills the animal. How could this little parasite possibly kill a moose? It all comes down to a numbers game. So let's imagine just as an average that there's 50,000 ticks on a moose, on a calf moose, because that's the age class that's actually experiencing the mortality. That calf moose has, let's say half of the ticks on it are female, about a 50-50 sex ratio. So it's 25,000 ticks that are all taking one to two milliliters of blood in a one to two week period. So that calf moose just cannot produce enough blood to keep up with what's being removed from the body. It's important to remember, this is also happening in mid to late March, which is the time period where a calf moose is most nutritionally deprived anyway. That animal is built to make it through the winter months, starting in the fall with a nice healthy fat reserve and kind of working off that fat reserve throughout the winter, waiting for green up. Green up in this part of New England happens mid-April into May. So that calf moose is using the last of its fat reserves, waiting for green up. It's in its lowest nutritional plane of the year. And then it has all, literally all of its blood removed in a two week period. The science shows that an animal or calf, again, can lose one and a half times its blood volume during that feeding period. So this actual form of mortality, the cause of mortality is most often anemia, and that's just a lack of red blood cells. This also relates to the animal's general nutrition. So when we are doing necropsies on these calves and we're finding these calves and they're dead, They've got a full stomach full of optimal forage. They're living in some of the best moose habitat that we have in moose range nationwide, yet they're still dying of a nutritional deficit. That nutritional deficit doesn't come in a form of food, though. It's coming in a form of a lack of blood cells and a lack of fat in order to make up for the loss of blood. This relationship between the parasite and the moose is unique to moose. We don't see this in deer. We don't see this in bear. We don't see animals strewn throughout the woods, dead of winter ticks, other than moose. And that's because of evolved grooming strategies. Moose are stimulus groomers, whereas deer, bear, turkeys, a lot of our other species that we have here in New England are programmed groomers. 
So a programmed groomer means that they evolve with parasites. When they lay down, they naturally groom themselves. You'll see a deer lay down in its bed and lick its back end, or you'll see a doe lick her fawn. You know, that's just a programmed thing in their head to keep themselves clean. Moose didn't evolve with parasites. Moose evolved up north. So they evolved to kick wolves and to run through deep snow. So they have really long legs and they're good at, ev at evading predators, but they're not good at keeping themselves clean. So a moose does not start grooming or itching is what a moose's form of grooming is until it, it feels it, until it itches, until it's stimulated. And at that point, it's too late. At that point, it has 50, 60, 90,000 ticks on it, and those ticks are already doing the damage. The grooming practice that moose do also isn't effective at removing the tick itself. Instead, it leads to, you'll see moose with large patches of, of fur missing, or the white ghost, white as a ghost is a common term, because as the moose rubs up against stuff, it breaks its guard hairs, and the end of the guard hair is white, so they'll get this white crappy appearance in the in the spring months and that's because they just don't have it in their nature to groom in a healthy manner to remove these parasites so what does this mean for moose moving forward we're going to see lower moose densities throughout new england this is a host parasite relationship that is resulting in a dead host uh, it's most parasites don't evolve in a way to kill their host because it doesn't make sense to kill the thing that keeps you alive but we saw an imbalance of this host parasite system in the late 90s early 2000s where moose populations skyrocketed throughout new england there wasn't a lot of hunting seasons or the hunting seasons were very restricted we had a lot of cutting after the spruce budworm of the 70s and 80s so we had really good habitat on the landscape no more no predators not a lot of mortality and we saw our moose population spike Following behind that, the tick population spike. Now we are coming into the system where the tick has kind of overstayed its welcome, has gotten too big for its britches per se, and is killing its host. At some point, that system is going to ebb and flow and catch up with itself. One theory of how we can remedy this quicker is to reduce moose densities to a level that isn't enough for the host or for the parasite to kill the host but still results in healthier moose. Uh, there's many different theories, including uh, working on different habitat selection or habitat management for moving moose about the landscape better. But the reality of it is this is a very difficult question for managers to address, and it's up to each state on how they're going to manage that.